Carol uh, is uh, founder and director and curator of the Sky. Is in architectural and urban history. She has researched, taught, and written about the history of American city building. Since establishing the museum, the Skyscraper Museum in New York in 97, Carol has mounted over 30 exhibitions on historical contemporary topics, local and global tall buildings. The exhibition were called Giants, the Twin Towers and the 20th Century, the Rise of Wall Street, Sky High and the Logic of Luxury, the Rise of Wall Street, uh, super tall and residential rising lower Manhattan since 9-11. Only the titles of her exhibitions, of course, uh, uh, bring us uh, uh, to her um, and uh, were the reasons to, to ask her to uh, open our series. She's an associate professor uh, at Urban Studies at Columbia University, where she teaches the graduate program and her program is called The Shape of Two Cities, New York and Paris. This is also interesting. Carol knows also the European city, not only the American city. She is the author of the prize-winning book, Form Follows Finance. So she basically with her um, book, she gave us the title for our uh, series here. Um, and the subtitle of her book is Skyscrapers and Skylines in New York and Chicago. Um, and uh, last but not least, Karen lives also in a high rise with her husband uh, in the middle of Manhattan. Welcome, Carol, and thank you for being with us on more or less high noon now in Manhattan. We are keen to hear the lecture on Form Follows Finance. Hi, I'm Carol Willis. I'm the founder and director of the Skyscraper Museum, and I'm here in the gallery in New York. I'm very sorry I can't be in, in Basel with you, but um, having a small museum is like having a small family business. It's not something you can get away with from very easily. So I'm um, hoping that we'll be able to have time to discuss and exchange some of the ideas that I'm very flattered um, to have uh, inspired with at least the title of my book, Form Follows Finance, um, a book that I wrote back, published in 1995, so a very good long time ago. But I haven't changed very much in my, uh, my kind of fundamental reading of the skyscraper as commercial architecture and the birth of the skyscraper uh, in the 1890s forward. The basic thesis of the book I want to review for you uh, during the lecture and to illustrate the, the fundamental ideas, but I, I also want to um, address in both the framing of this talk as well as um, in its conclusion what I think are some of the issues that Christian Blazier is uh, raising for your full series. So um, if I can, I'll just begin by showing you some recent images of New York and try to put the history of the skyscraper into a, um, a, uh, a title uh, of highest and best use uh, with a question mark that charts the changes over time uh, in commercial architecture and sometimes in the use of the high rise for office versus residential, um, which is of course the meaning uh, in real estate terms of highest and best use. So if we take a look at the um, midtown skyline of Manhattan, uh, as seen actually from my apartment, I'm very fortunate to have the, um, this view to look at every day. Uh, we see my favorite building, the Empire State Building, uh, my, certainly my favorite skyscraper, uh, and a number of other towers um, that you can see that uh, that that rose in the 1990s and in the in the later 2000s uh, or our current 2000s uh, ones that you can see in my cursor here pointing which are all residential buildings all of these um, in the farther distance on 42nd street empire state building is on 34th street um, here we see with my cursor showing you the um, one vanderbilt a new tower a new office tower that uh, has 
uh, been topped out now for a couple of years. Uh, and so you see a mix of residential uses and office commercial uses in the skyline. Uh, you also see now famously uh, this kind of family or suite of super slender ultra luxury condo towers that um, have taken the name Billionaire's Row that uh, line 57th Street and fall on the south side of Central Park across which uh, lawn we are seeing these, uh, these skinny towers. Uh, and uh, if, as I point to the tallest of them, which uh, here is the Central Park Tower and the very first one to be built, 157. This, the skinniest of all, called 111 West 57th Street. Uh, not the tallest, but certainly the most uh, slender and an extraordinary engineering accomplishment. 432 Park Avenue and then um, an, uh, another Ramsa building um, here on the far left side, 520 uh, Park Avenue and sorry, um, back on this side, on the far right side, another Robert A. M. Stern Tower, which is called 220 Central Park um, South, uh, the, uh, the biggest buyout of any, in terms of the financial success for the developer of any of these condominium towers thus far. Uh, you see them here pyramiding up in the skyline from a kind of extraordinary um, uh, zoo collapsed uh, version uh, from Central Park. Uh, and you see them as a kind of mountain-like culmination in the same way that in 1929, Hugh Ferris, uh, in the cover of his book, The Metropolis of Tomorrow, retold or recapitulated the history of architecture from the pyramids to the skyscraper um, in a kind of fantasy rendering. That kind of piling up of, uh, of monuments of the history of architecture uh, that are also a, a, a growth towards the tallest point in the sky uh, gets a new variation in the early 20th century with the commercial towers of New York, the skyscrapers of New York. Um, and here in this marketing uh, image for the Singer Tower, which you can see at the very center here, uh, as well as the commercial high rises, um, and one here with my cursors looking at, at on either side that are flanking the Singer Tower, which in 1908, when it was finished, was the tallest building in the world. And you can see that it exceeds um, even the tip of the um, all masonry uh, Washington Monument in Washington or the, um, the broken tip of the Pyramid of, of uh, Cheops in, in um, Cairo. So the commercial architecture of New York ex becomes the tallest structure uh, in the world uh, and represents too a change from in the history of architecture, these other buildings that you're seeing in the foreground uh, that were built for religious purposes or um, a symbol of, uh, well, the church or of the state, um, city hall towers are some that you see here. Uh, and those buildings in the history of architecture um, represent statements of power and of wealth um, that cost money to erect. But the skyscrapers of New York and indeed all skyscrapers, I would argue, are commercial architecture. Um, they follow the laws of economics. Um, their form does follow the financial arrangements of raising money in order to create a business plan to produce money through rents. And so they are distinguished uh, from the history of architecture for not just costing money, but for making money. And if that at that kind of underlying basic level was the um, argument and I hope the insight of Form Follows Finance. Uh, you see the cover here is my 1995 book and you see the subtitle, Skyscrapers and Skylines in New York and Chicago. So the question I was asking in this book is um, if the office, um, the cell of the individual office, um, kind of as Corbusier said, the, the, the plan of that cell is the generator um, and the multiplication of that space 
um, into a floor plan and then into multiple floors in the um, in the machine to make the land pay the the plans of rents pancaked one on top of another. Um, if it's if that um, use is and the plan of the individual office is the same in New York and Chicago. Why do the city's architecture look so different? Why are their skylines so distinctive and different? And that's what I explored in the book. So on the one hand, I said, skyscrapers, they're all about economics. Uh, on the other hand, the argument of the book, um, and I hope the takeaway from this lecture, because this is the complication that, um, I, that I would like to um, kind of um, imbue into the argument of, of the whole series, that it's not just about economics. Um, it's also uh, about regulation. And in this kind of search for the real estate principle of highest and best use, I want to use a few images that I took only um, a couple of weeks ago of Park Avenue here in New York uh, and the buildings that line it from about uh, 49th Street and 50th Street um, going north. And if I use my cursor to point out for you uh, a 1960 or so tower, a 1980s or 90s postmodern re-facade of uh, a tower that looked very much like the, the, the one in, in front of it. Um, down here, Lever House, the famous SOM early, first um, glass curtain wall in New York. Um, and then besides the other ones you see in the left and the right, this slender tower with its white gridded um, module, uh, 432 Park Avenue, the Raphael Vignoli design for the uh, slender luxury condos um, that uh, rose about um, six years ago um, now on the skyline as the tallest rooftop in New York at that time. Um, and for um, in a, and the tallest one period, but it was a residential building. So if we look back at um, this is actually is the other side of the street uh, in the 1950s, I think 1956, um, where you're looking at Park Avenue. If I toggle back, um, you can see how similar that building is on the left hand side. Uh, today and the ones that you are um, seeing here in the in the vintage photograph. Uh, what this image is telling you is that even though those are not the same building by the same architect, doesn't matter because it's really the zoning law. It's the code, the building code and the zoning law that designed these buildings. So the, the shapes that you're seeing here are a function of the regulation um, that um, that overlays the development process um, in New York. So um, looking a little bit farther up the street, we see SOM's um, Olivetti Pepsi-Cola uh, building, beautiful glass facade from the 1960s. We see a um, residential tower here in the foreground in a brown brick, and actually the Ramsa building, the Robert A.M. Stern residential design, it's not the same building here, it's another one behind it um, that you can see where once again, the residential tower has now surpassed the commercial buildings, the office the space um, of the previous uh, generation as the highest and best use. Um, and what you're seeing as we look farther north uh, along Park Avenue is that the residential buildings that were built in the 19 teens uh, and uh, in, in the 20s uh, remain in place uh, as the, uh, you know, the, the historic view of the avenue that you can see here as it was developing, now going back through time uh, in the 1940s or so in this photograph, where as you can see, the cars have been privileged um, in to, by taking over the road um, and a roadbed that is directly above the railroad tracks that come into Grand Central. So that's why Park Avenue um, developed as, as it did um, as a kind of northward tra trajectory of the um, tr the transportation nexus uh, around Grand Central. So you can see here on either side of Park Avenue, the uh, posh apartments of the very wealthy um, as they began to populate and expand um, farther north along Park Avenue. Um, you can see them here in, now we're going back in time in an earlier view um, with churches of their neighborhoods um, that would have been frequented by the, the people who lived in the apartments in Penn 
tenant houses. Um, and you can see here that the park part of Park Avenue was larger before the cars began to take over the city. Uh, today, looking above 61st Street or so that you're seeing here, these the identity of Park Avenue as a residential uh, kind of um, enclave um, has is is unchanged um, and this idea of the highest best use and the value of land I want to underscore with this historic map of land values um, in New York by the Regional Plan of New York and its environs um, it's published back in the 1930s but a survey of land values that contrasted or showed the progress from um, 1914 to 1923 show you in black the highest land values in red the next and going down to uh, green and yellow and you can see um, I will run my, in the 1923 version, my cursor over Fifth Avenue and Park Avenue would be just um, two, two streets over here. You can see in this area here that's green and yellow, um, the part of the city that you see in my um, photograph. So the higher demand for, uh, for rents and the highest demand the, the highest rents um, being obtained through office uh, space um, until until into the um, 20, 2012s or so in New York usually determined what the land value was and what the height of the building was um, but the demand and speculation to build tall to build commercial architecture as skyscrapers was um, damped and tamped by regulation, as I have suggested already in those slides, but that I show you in some um, analysis drawings by Hugh Ferris, who we saw before, um, who in the 1960s uh, or as in the 50s, as these, this new zoning law was being contemplated and, and crafted, uh, is showing you the contrast between what you see in the middle, the setback skyscraper that I'm going to amplify uh, a description of um, in just a few moments, uh, and the new um, more constrained towers that you're seeing in two options on the right and um, on the left, uh, on my left being uh, the tower, the rectilinear simple tower that rises out of a, a bigger base, but is set back from the street in a plaza, which was part of the impulse um, uh, to gain more open space and to constrain the bulk of buildings that um, drove the zoning law revisions in New York in 1961 and shaped the skyline in a different way after 1961 than it did in 1916 when the first zoning law was passed. So just moving quickly through these, which we will see again, you can see the basic principle of the floor area ratio um, and the lot size and how much floor area can be stacked one floor above another, um, depending on if you use the entire space or a smaller amount of the space, because it's only the floor space, the interior floor space that's being measured and um, constricted or constrained. So, um, so we are going to turn now from these views of, um, of Park Avenue where you can see play out the highest and best use changing from office, one kind of office buildings to a new formulation under a new zoning code in the 1960s. Um, and then a different kind of economic equation that made residential buildings more valuable than office buildings. Uh, and I'm going to show you all of those now by returning to the history that as I tell it in Form Follows Finance. So um, as I have already explained, um, the the premise of the book was really to, to look at the two cities where the skyscraper developed in New York and in Chicago, uh, and to see why they looked different in each place. Um, and, uh, and the most important reason uh, is the platting of the land in Chicago is the big um, open space and the square grid with its great big blocks uh, at, of, the, um, of the Midwestern Prairie. Uh, in the city that grew up only from the 1830s, as opposed to in New York, a colonial city established in the 17th century that grew organically over time and concentrated in the business area that you're seeing here with my cursor around Wall Street. So uh, the 
this wonderful map uh, that was created in 1903 by Richard Hurd, a land economist, one of the first land economists in that kind of dis that discipline evolved, shows you the the um, land values per square foot in New York at different positions or different places, different geographies of the city. Uh, and while you probably can't see these from where you're sitting, I will just tell you that the highest land value per square foot in New York was at the corner of Wall Street and um, Nassau Street and Broad Street. So right across the street from the New York Stock Exchange, right at the um, the, the US sub-treasury where all the banks were located, JP Morgan, et cetera. Um, and the next highest are along Wall Street too, and um, then along the corridor of Broadway where it's um, $300, so not $400 a square foot, but $350 a square foot, varying up to about $200 a square foot until you get to very close to um, City Hall right here in City Hall Park, where it's also $200 a square foot. Um, but then you notice, or I will, will call your attention to with the borders of the waterfront, the value of the land is not $400 a square foot, but 15 or $10 a square foot. And on this side, on the East River side, $7 a square foot, seven, $10 a square foot. Uh, so these first three principles of real estate um, development, uh, the famous uh, first three principles, location, location, and location, are illustrated by this um, photograph of about 1915 or 16 uh, uh, with Wall Street running right through here where my cursor is going through, right from Trinity Church going east. Um, you see the equitable building, um, the largest bulk, as well as, well, not the tallest in terms of the height, that would be the Singer building at the time, but you see how these buildings are all crowded together and that congestion around um, place uh, around the banks, around the money center, gives gravity to this place and tries to crowd a lot of workspaces onto these very valuable addresses. Um, so you saw that in the Richard Hurd map. Um, if we turn to Chicago and look at it by contrast, the Chicago buildings here and seen here in the 1890s um, are not as tall as in New York, and that's because a height cap was put on Chicago buildings in, in 1893. They were not allowed to build any taller um, than uh, about, was, well, it was 120 feet. They moved up and down a little bit, 140 feet. Uh, but in that range of a 12 or 14 story building, uh, the building code had a height limit um, so that Chicago developed on its great big square blocks um, with bulky buildings that, as you can see, needed to be penetrated at their centers by light courts. So because they were so big in their footprint and because buildings were illuminated principally by daylight because there were no efficient uh, incandescent lights, certainly no fluorescent, no, no cool fluorescent lights at the time. So buildings were um, ventilated by opening windows, but they were more, most importantly lit by, uh, by sunlight. Uh, and so the Chicago buildings, form follows finance describes, um, evolve very differently because they need to be penetrated at their center by open light courts. Whereas New York buildings on their very small tight lots can rise as towers where everything is condensed around an empty core, which is the vertical transportation system with the perimeter, a tight perimeter of offices around that core. Um, so here you see those big blocks of um, Chicago that are cut at their center by, um, by kind of alleys um, that are, are places for um, delivery off the main streets. Um, this is just to, to, to show you very simply what those great big blocks are and how buildings occupy portions of that space. But most big buildings, rose up to the height that was limited um, by the zoning code at that time or the building code in Chicago, uh, which didn't change until 1924. And you can see they end up looking almost identical to each other because their lot sizes were, their sa were the same and their heights were capped. So they were big palazzo-like um, uh, office blocks that usually had classical references and no towers. So the skyline of, New of Chicago began to look this way too. 
in contrast to the skyline of New York, which was a city of towers um, from the 1890s when buildings began to exceed about 20 stories um, through here in this uh, postcard image that shows you on the far left side, the Woolworth building, tallest building in the world in 1913, almost 800 feet tall, sorry about the feet instead of the meters, but um, uh, you can see that um, towers figure importantly in the, in the skyline, but there are bigger, bulkier buildings as well because big bulky buildings make money. Uh, the skyline that you see contrasted here from the same position across the Hudson River um, in Jersey, uh, in 1902 at the top, um, and in 1921 shows you here is the Woolworth building that isn't there um, at the time that the Park Row building finished in 1899 was the tallest building in the world at the beginning of the 20th century. And here you see the Park Row building about half the height of the Woolworth building um, in, the, in the skyline that keeps just ever rising. Now, um, the Skyscraper Museum did an exhibition a few years ago called Ten and Taller that was a survey, a complete survey of every building in New York that was 10 stories or taller um, from 1870, the first one in 1874 to 1900 when um, steel cage construction became so ubiquitous uh, as a building material um, that, uh, that there was very little constraint and there was ex explosion in, bu in buildings. You can see them here on this map in the footprints, and you can see this on our website, so you can play with the map, you can play with the dates and the footprints and add them slowly um, over time, year by year. But you can see very clearly that in Lower Manhattan, Richard Hurd's area in the land values, the office buildings, which are red, are clustered together. Um, they continue up Broadway to City Hall Park and then up Broadway and to the west uh, to Union Square. Um, and when buildings become blue here around 34th Street and north of 34th Street, 42nd and up to Central Park, um, the, the two blue colors uh, are a change in use to residential. So simultaneously, tall buildings in New York were office buildings or residential buildings, apartments or hotels, um, representing these completely different uses that I began the, the lecture with um, in, in contrasting. Uh, so Ten and Taller, I invite you to look at on our website on, on your own, um, also develops a timeline that adds each one of these buildings by its height on this kind of bar graph um, and color coded with the office buildings in red, as I said, the residential in blue, um, and adding into this mix, as you can see, kind of discern in orange, loft buildings, um, that is buildings that were just empty spaces that were not as well appointed for um, white collar work uh, as office buildings, but that house any range of light manufacturing, especially garment districts, publishing houses. So it might be offices uh, along with some kind of light manufacturing. And you see the proliferation after 1893 of, of loft buildings. There is many loft buildings as there are office, beings, uh, office buildings being built in New York. Uh, the office buildings do constitute the tallest of those towers and height we kind of correlates with prestige. And just to make um, that point, um, to look at our graph, to take all of the buildings over uh, 200 feet tall, and just to take their tops, you see the tallest buildings in New York at this time, and they're all office buildings. Um, but if we look at not tall, but all, the multitude of buildings, you can see how many of them have other uses. If they were all to be capped at the same height, the way Chicago capped um, its buildings at the same time. So um, we return to this kind of pyramid of the um, rise of commercial architecture in the history of architecture and the history of height uh, with the Singer building at the center. Uh, we look 
um, at the at the real competition for just just vertical height with the Woolworth Building, world's tallest building in in 1913. And then we look at the floor plans of both of these buildings. The this is the Woolworth Building, and where you can see in this period um, plan drawing the offices. Each one is a single cell. Uh, whole floors could be rented, but in the Woolworth Building, as a matter of fact, most tenants occupied a single office. So they came in off a double loaded corridor, either to um, look out the window to the street or into the light court so that the window is, is illuminating the space. Um, but the spaces are small. And this meant that the Woolworth building, which had um, some 55 floors, had more than a thousand tenants in it. So there were lots of small enterprises, not one big company that would take up many floors or even a single floor. It's very important distinction that is not often made when we think of office buildings as uh, commercial architecture, as office buildings, as corporate um, hives of industry. Uh, if we look at the equitable building, um, the largest building in the world, not the tallest, but the largest building in the world, 1.2 million square feet of, of office space. And we see its floor plan. We see something very important that I'm going to trace through the Empire State Building uh, in the 1920s, and that is the idea of economic height. Um, you see also how the light court penetrates here from the major streets of Broadway and the back street, uh, which is um, Nassau Street, you see the elevator core rising through the center and the banks of elevators, and you see that all of the space around the core is a uniform, it's about 28 feet, sorry for the feet again, um, from the out from a window um, to the interior corridor. That is the fundamental um, uh, controlling principle of, of the plan of skyscrapers through, um, through the 1940s and the invention of fluorescent light. So here we see the equitable building um, as the biggest building um, in the world when it was uh, finished in 1915. Uh, and to return to this crowded, congested, uh, and competitive financial district, um, you see it here lording over um, the other buildings and um, most especially from the perspective of the buildings uh, around it, casting those buildings into shadow for a good part of the day, and especially the buildings on its north side on, you know, over to the left. That gigantic building casting a shadow, stealing the light from the adjacent buildings. Uh, and that concern brought about a regulation in New York that was the first um, comprehensive zoning law in any American city. Uh, it was New York's first constraint on construction. There, was, there were building codes at first, but this was a constraint on the, sh the shape of the building, the form of the building. Uh, the, the value that the government was trying to protect with zoning is in that V-shape that you see. It was the protection of sunlight coming down onto the street. So the buildings had to set back so that V of sunlight um, can open up and fall onto the street, illuminate the street, give it fresh air, give it sunlight, um, and those healthful values. There were three, four, there are actually five formulas, you see three here, but that setback design carries over into the formal development of the skyscraper in New York and brands the architecture of this era from 1916 forward, so especially the Art Deco buildings of the 1920s, um, as described in these, these kind of uh, utopian megastructures that Hugh Ferris, uh, again, my, my man Hugh Ferris um, drew, uh, and others described in wireframe drawings, which as you can see are not nearly so inspirational for architects as the Ferris massing studies. Um, but indeed, Ferris did seem to inspire the architects to a kind of simplicity that had a modern character and that was celebrated as the modern skyscraper, not disguised as in some historical style. So we see a very utilitarian model of this in the uh, New Yorker Hotel um, or downtown with a feature of the zoning code that allowed for a tower of unlimited height um, that could rise over a, a quarter of the site. And that's what you're seeing at this building, which was called the City Services Building at now called 70 Pine Street. Uh, 
we see it that pyramid and the um, the ubiquity of these setback masses um, in this kind of mound of commercialism uh, around Wall Street. We're seeing it just under the Brooklyn Bridge across the the East River, uh, and that is the image of New York from the 1920s forward. Uh, and I want to show you with the uh, my favorite skyscraper, the Empire State Building, looking at this solution applied to this one extraordinary building and see how form follows finance um, in this um, signature 1930 tower. So here we see it from the air and here we see it in a massing study that was drawn by one of the architects of the Empire State Building by Richmond Shreve um, of Shreve Lamb and Harmon uh, for a book that he co-authored called uh, um, A Study of the Economic Height of Office Buildings. Here's the cover of the book, The Skyscraper, A Study of Its Economic Height. Um, and here you see uh, I won't go into this at length, but you can find, you know, the explanation in Form Follows Finance of um, various cuts uh, so if the building were cut off at any of those dotted lines, he calculated what would be the return on investment for a building of 50 stories, 63 stories, 72 stories. Um, and how do you get to the economic height? The economic height being the number of stories that will return the highest percentage of return on the money that you invest in the building. Of course, taller buildings cost more to build. You have to invest more. And this is essentially, as I illustrate again in Form Follows Finance, the blueprint of the Empire State Building. It's a sheet of numbers that contrasts a 50, the expense and the rent return of a 55-story building versus an 80-story building. 80 stories comes out a little bit ahead, they decide to build an 80-story building. Um, it doesn't have its distinctive spire, the crown called the mooring mast in the very first design uh, that was published. Um, this, this one that you see for a 86 story tower that's just flat topped. Uh, and you see the floor plans as they pyramid up, but as the elevator core contracts, but remains continuous. And so the, as the elevator banks fall away, so does the building. But this is within the lines of the sunlight plane, the sky plane um, that zoning prescribes in New York. Um, we'll skip the floor plan, but you can see the, um, the, the core of the elevators. Uh, and as we did with the equitable building, see the continuous uh, depth of the building that never exceeds 28 feet from the outs from the interior corridor to the outside window. Uh, you see the illuminated workspace that was typical in the small incandescent lights. So that setback shape um, in New York, you can see in the Hugh Ferris, this return to the Hugh Ferris drawing, uh, was the uh, form follow finance formula for the skyscraper for Park Avenue or for um, downtown for the financial district, uh, but it was curtailed um, in a radical revision of the zoning law in 1961 that was discussed for about five years before then. And these drawings date from that time, from some of the earlier iterations when they're trying to come up with this new formula. And the new formula as I already explained, limits the floor area, a maximum floor area or ratio or to the lot or FAR. Um, and that's what you're seeing here again. Um, I'll pass by quickly as I begin to run out of time. But this, um, this view of the Seagram building, of course, um, set back from Park Avenue in uh, on a platform, a kind of Acropolis. Uh, so Mies van der Rohe designed a space that you traversed in order to come to this, um, this simple prism of glass and steel, the materials of the modern age, the honest expression of structure um, that uh, post-war uh, commercial architecture developed, certainly along with the principles, embracing the principles of the international style. This building proceeds the passage um, of the 1961 zoning law and it influences it as well. So the, the, um, the uh, 
appreciation and indeed the incentivization of open space like the plaza that surrounds the, the Seagram building is built into an incentive program that's, um, that's a part of the 1961 zoning law. And this yields the, um, the very similar repetitive boxes uh, that represent the economic height of these buildings on 6th Avenue, so Avenue of the Americas, um, set back from the avenue to open up for more sunlight, but also to add the space that's open on the street to the top of the tower where it's more valuable. So in an open space is tra it's traded for enclosed space at the top of the tower that you wouldn't have been able to build otherwise under the new zoning law in New York. Uh, that same principle um, is applied, is manipulated and applied to the super slender ultra luxury condo towers of Billionaires Row. And we're seeing um, here across uh, 56th Street, um, I guess, yes, 50, 50, uh, 58th Street, actually, uh, the most slender sides of, uh, of 220 Central Park uh, south on the west and of one of Central Park Towers on the right. Uh, these very slender towers, you can see in the lineup um, of uh, New York super slenders that are on the Skyscraper Museum's website. And you can see them at scale against the shadows of the super talls um, uh, around the world like the Burj Dubai, which is also a residential building, of course, or the working from the right to the left, the Shanghai Tower, or the hotel that is um, the Mecca Clock Tower, et cetera. You can see how gigantic in terms of their floor space, the super talls are. They're both taller, but they're much, much bigger um, in the amount of, of, of bulk or of floor space that's created. So super slenders are tall, but they're not big buildings. They are profitable um, in a way that we described in an exhibition that we did at the museum in 2014 and 15 uh, called Sky High and the Logic of Luxury. And I invite you to go to our website where you can see that whole um, archived virtual exhibition. This was um, from the lecture series there. So um, to, uh, to move into the conclusion over demand um, and speculation, which is what drives the tall building. Um, I want to reference a, a play that I saw just last year, the, um, the Lehman trilogy. I don't know if you, they've um, played it in Switzerland or any, you saw it maybe in, in London, um, that, um, that illuminated the the progress of capitalism for me in a way that I think I understood from my economist husband well enough and from reading newspapers, um, but um, understood so much more clearly in this historical trajectory that is exposed through the three brothers of the um, Lehman family and the Lehman trilogy. Um, in a, a wonderful um, architectural set, um, as you see them here, you, track them from their arrival from Germany um, to New Orleans, where they became brokers, where they, um, they, they not brokers, but they, they, um, they sold commodities to farmers like hose and cam uh, um, farm tools and, and canvas bags. Uh, various things happen. They lend money to the farmers. They get into futures. They get into banking. They come to New York. They expand to London and other markets. And in a continuous evolution, their investment in real commodities um, turns into the exchange of futures and securities and banks and financial institutions that is the way that we think of our financial world today. And so if I come back to the themes that I think that Christian is, is trying to pursue in, in your series, um, I, um, I, I am very happy to discuss those in the Q&A session, but I wanna return to this kind of fundamental idea that's, that at least when we're looking at skyscrapers, we are looking at commercial architecture. Commercial architecture, which is searching for its highest and best use, whether it's, um, a square meter of office space or um, a, a square meter of uh, luxury condominiums, a penthouse in the sky, 
the building that will return the most money on the investment um, is the one that is the highest and best use. And as we saw on Park Avenue and elsewhere, those changing uses um, shift according to real estate cycles, according to demand, according to zoning laws, um, and they may, they may well shift again. Uh, and meanwhile, in New York, simultaneously, we have uh, a rise of new office buildings um, that are very tall and very large and of the super slender type, which has now been demonstrated as a, a, a kind of clear development um, formula, as well as an engineering solution to the super tall that yields extraordinarily high prices. Um, so with that, um, I'm delighted to, uh, to, to engage your questions and um, thank you very much for your attention and your invitation to speak. So um, let's try this. Um, thank you very much, Carol. Um, of course, um, I'm very impressed by uh, these facts. And um, of course, in Europe, we are a little bit more uh, moderate um, uh, and, and a little bit more away from the um, economic driven architecture. But also, we face the fact that um, our, most of our apartments are owned by pension funds, uh, that we have very long mortgages, the, 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 uh, our houses belong to the banks and, and, and not to, to us, even though we say we own a house, but my house is maybe 80% belonging to the, to the bank. And also, we don't have to uh, pay the mortgage off like in other countries. So this is a little bit special uh, here in Switzerland. But um, I, I want to start um, with a, a, a first uh, question. And um, this uh, would be, of course, we see that you personally think and you also proved uh, that Manhattan skyscrapers and Chicago's high buildings are driven by the, by the finance industry, developers, uh, investors. Um, and how and where in that exactly do you think money plays also a major role? Or in other words, how much does it go into aesthetics? Um, was that also a point, um, for example, how much steel an architect used per square meter or so? Um, how much was it really in, in, uh, driven into this um, economic cycle? And were there also architects that did other things that let themselves do high buildings uh, a little bit out of the economic uh, cycle? Well, I think that um the complications of the simplicity of form follows finance uh, have other factors that I didn't have time to discuss in the talk, but which are very real and which are marginal, one of which is aesthetics, whether one calls it ornament or materiality, the quality of materials. Um, one thinks of Mies van der Rohe and the Seagram building. Um, there's an extra element of expense, but there is a, a payback in terms of status. Likewise, location has status. Um, design value of, today we call it branding, that has um, status. So I, th I think there are these additional factors that are incremental value propositions or, or variables in the equation of the formula form follow the, the formula for profit and one of the reasons um, that I wanted to talk about the ultra luxury condominium towers the residential architecture and their profitability is that um, in an exhibition that I mentioned um, the sky high and the logic of luxury that looked at these super slender towers the the subtitle, The Logic of Luxury, was an explanation about how one, if one spends extra money, one can reap higher profits. So the, the element of luxury gets baked into the equation 
in some places in an opposite way that one thinks usually of um, value engineering or function or extreme utilitarian functionalism, uh, where the lowest price, the, the, the cheapest solution is, is what you kind of devolve to. So, so I think there are many ways that additional variables come into the side to, from in from each side of the um, formula for um, form follows finance. So, so maybe so for the Basel, Basel people, people, could you tell us what such an apartment can cost? Uh, I, we, we probably have no idea, and they will knock us down, especially if the people are not even living there. But but what would, would such an apartment uh, cost these days? I can tell you that, but I will reserve you know that punchline um, for after the basic predicate about um, values of, of private real estate in, in New York City. So a one a small one bedroom apartment in New York is a million dollars, right? Uh, so the penthouse apartments in any one of the billionaires row will range from the lower floors, maybe in the smallest apartments, three or four million dollars to let's say $30 million, $50 million. And there is one, um, the, the one that, that I mentioned, Central um, 220 Central Park West, the Robert A.M. Stern design um, by a very large developer in, in New York, Stephen Roth of Vornado. They have sold um, the top three floors of the of that building for a total of 200 and I think 20, 20 million dollars. So phenomenal prices. A hundred million dollars is the aspirational price that a de the de developer really wants to get. Um, but if um, your colleagues would like to go to, to look at the exhibition, The Logic of Luxury, which we did more than five years ago. There we quantify the per square foot cost, which is the other key way to understand the, 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 the formula. Uh, per, well, per square foot is how, how New York values um, these uh, properties. So um, it's unclear how much these buildings cost to build, but let's say maybe $1,500 um, a square foot for the construction cost, but the sale price is at least $5,000 a square foot and up to $10,000 a square foot. So there's a great deal of room for profit in a successful project. Das ist etwa, um, 50 to 100,000 Franken per, per square meter. So I just try to transfer it easily into um, uh, dollar per square meter. Um, are there any questions? Um, can also ask it in German and I translate. Is there still no limitation on the height? Yes, the, the, the question is if there is um, still a, a height limitation these days, or can you briefly explain how this works that you can get so tall and with these air rights? Because this, this we don't have either. Right. Uh, well, this is a whole nother hour lecture, so uh, maybe an, another time I can really explain it properly. But um, in, sh in brief, the principle um, that I tried to explain of the zoning law that exists in New York from 1961 through today limits the, the floor area, not the height. There is no cap on height uh, in New York other than a sky plane. If you, you can't go above the angle of, of the sky plane, but that allows you to go very, very tall. Um, but the floor area, the physical amount of floor space piled one on top of the other can go as, to unlimited height. But the floor area is radically constrained in New York. You can purchase unused, undeveloped air rights from only from adjacent properties. So only contiguous sites. Um, but those air rights can be purchased and then piled on the top of the building. So a tiny little, like a balloon, a, is the more you squeeze the balloon in, the long skinny balloon, um, and the taller it gets in 
relation is, is the same amount of floor space um, as a short fat building. So that's how the, the formula of FAR plus um, purchased air rights allow you to go to unlimited height. Just very brief, uh, I explain it. Um, so, also, uh, es ist wie bei uns um, eine Bebauung, eine Bebauungs- und Nutzungsziffer. Und um, what they also do then, they don't uh, put apartments in all um, floors. They have some voids, also only, only apartments, and then they can go higher, for example. Or they can have some mechanical floor that don't count. Um, and the air rights, das sind die Rechte, wo man kann kaufen kann, Sichtrechte in anderen Parzellen, kann man von den umliegenden Parzellen bauen. And, and what was very uh, interesting to me, that uh, I think it was at 57 or 56th Street, that one of the towers, the ultra thin towers, was built completely into another, another building. So it had not even a direct access to the street. It was planted into an existing building. I, I, I don't recall which one, if it's the Vignoli or what. But um, uh, so there are all kinds of, of, of tricks. And, and of course, if you have a very slender building, the shadow cast is not so high. And you have seen that the angle of the, the light is much steeper in, 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 uh, in New York. It's, it's maybe, it's, what is it? Was is this, 30 or 80 degrees or 60 degrees? And we have this 45, but they have a very steep angle, so, so they can, can go much higher. Um, other, other questions? Auch in Deutsch? Kann man etwas fragen? Um, now, now um, when I walk through uh, um, the um, Wall Street district, I saw that some of the Wall Street buildings were already rented out or, or uh, refurnished as uh, apartment buildings. The question is, what happens if the office more or less disappears in, in the future? If office goes di more digital, the financial industry goes digital. I heard that these financial people are now living in, in uh, Florida and they do this from the computer. They don't need to be in a, in a very expensive tower in my, in, in, at Wall Street anymore. What happens if, if the... Um, uh, the office disappears to the to the skyscraper in a, in a in a financial city like New York, London, or or Shanghai or whatever. What do you think? Well, this is a question that many people have been asking because of of COVID. Um, as a historian, I like to take the long view, and what is completely clear about not just the history of New York, but the history of, of cities is that cities have so many multiplying um, variables of efficiency, of human interaction and decisions, which are separate from the immediacy of the, of the workplace or the change of the markets. I think actually, so I, I have no fear that, um, that we are in for a radical shift of the urban economy. Uh, the, uh, or, or, or the way that people work. I, I don't think it'll last much longer than probably three or four years till we're back at probably a four day work week. But you know, who am I to project those things? What as a historian I would call attention to is New York after 9-11 and especially lower Manhattan after 9-11 because um, for a decade. So for the first 10 years of the 21st century, and we are only in the second 10 years of, the, of, of that century um, now, or a little, little more than that, downtown was a catastrophic site, right? It had a void of um, 16 acres, you know, so, you know, eight, 10 hectares, a void, unpassable, um, horrific in its uh, in the in the, the sight of it. It took ten years to gain a ground plane back at, at ground zero, and yet, despite that incredible setback to the economy, to the built environment, to the um, urban the, the 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 urban amenities of living in Lower Manhattan, 
the population doubled in lower Manhattan. So there was in part a, a positive transformation of the neighborhoods in, uh, of downtown so that more people lived downtown. There were apartments that were um, adaptively reused from older office buildings into new residential space. So that's what I expect will happen in New York in a place like Midtown. Downtown is already transformed into more of a neighborhood. It is not completely dependent on the financial district because the banks moved to offshore, you know, around the world in the 1990s, not in, not in the, the, the 2000s and 20s. So those changes have already happened in terms of the shifting economy, the commodification of, of real estate so that um, the ownership of portfolios where, where buildings are simply profit sheets rather than an owned and operated enterprise where you know, a, a, a developer is then paid rents for the office space or for the apartment. So all of these things happen in the larger economies. And I think that the trajectory that you have identified in the framing of, the, of this series is something which is very real. And the difference between New York and, and, and Europe as um, land ownership and markets and government policies make different situations. But the, but the logic of capital does have this kind of abstraction that you're, you're talking about. Uh, and, and the richer people profit from that, that system is absolutely true. But at the same time, and I think um, what my lecture tried to illustrate is that demand and speculation um, are these entrepreneurial engines of enterprise and urban economies. Um, that will change cities somewhat through time, but will leave them essentially our, our best hope for civilization, really. I'm a great urban advocate, as you can tell. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, well, yeah. My slide is changed um, uh, during um, the change of um, economic interest. The life cycle change of of a building in terms of uh, expectation of a uh, return on investment? No. Ah, uh, or auch in, in, intern uh, remodeled, or? Uh, yeah, what it, I mean, basically you ask, uh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Uh, you, are <clears throat> you ask basically what is the lifespan of, of, of a high rise? Uh, generally, um, uh, were high buildings already de demolished because the land uh, value went up and also the, the interior and so on? Uh, what, what is the lifespan uh, of such a high rise? So um, there are many different answers. The Empire State Building will um, soon, well, in, in 10 years, it's 90 years old now. Right, it'll be a hundred years old. The Woolworth Building uh, is more is 120 years old, and um, it still functions as both an office building and now changed to converted to residential in the tower section. So, depending on the quality of the building um, or its easy adaptability as a as a, a new a new use um, of space. There's no, you know, as in, as in Germany, you reclad buildings all of the time. I know Frankfurt has, has modern buildings built in the 1960s that have had two or three different facades updated. And New York is doing that now too, but, um, but the more important lesson I hope of, of my lecture is that growth is constrained by regulation in New York. This, this, you can't keep tearing down and building up a bigger building. Taller, yes, but no more floor space than existed before. And the continuous, over a hundred years, the continuous progress of planning New York has been to take away a city of no controls to a city of some kind of control and then a greater control on top of that. And now what one sees um, is much more a kind of um, community-based uh, bottom-up planning 
voice that has entered the conversation. And so that is a very much of a balancing or a mitigating factor against these forces of capital that we have, have been discussing. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there another question? So um, in that case, I, I want to close and go over to a small uh, opera, which unfortunately you can't be part of, but I hope uh, by the end of the year that you can make it to Basel. Thank you very much, Carol, for um, this great lecture, the personal reception at the museum and uh, giving us the right to use uh, the title. Um, thank you for opening and uh, giving us um, lots of thoughts um, for our series. Thanks, uh, Max, for the repeated collaboration and uh, uh, for uh, the technique, uh, the complex technique. Uh, Claudia, also thanks for uh, being a part uh, since, uh, since the beginning of the Schauraum. Um, and uh, we see each other on the 14th of September at six uh, with Andreas Courvasier on a Stadtpaziergang, Stadtpaziergang Andreas Courvasier von Courvasier Stadtentwicklung, ähm, selbstverwaltete Wohnmodelle. Wir treffen uns äh, um 18 Uhr vor dem Musiker Wohnhaus äh, in der Stiftung Habitat an der Lothringer Straße ähm, und gehen verschiedene Projekte anschauen, wo eben andere ökonomische äh, Basen haben als ähm, normale ähm, Häuser, die ähm, einem Einzelperson oder so oder einer Pensionskasse gehören. Ähm, würde mich freuen, wenn ihr da kommen würdet und ähm, wird sicher auch sehr spannend. Wir werden äh, ins Westfeld, Felix Platter Spital gehen können, auch reingehen können als eine der vielleicht ersten. Es wird dann gerade so halb fertig sein. Besten Dank. Thank you, Carol, uh, to New York, and have a good day. And um, I hope you have a good evening, and let's talk some uh, together outside by, with a glass of wine. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.